All right. So essence noting, um, this is a technique I wanted to share in part because it straddles so many different ways to meditate. It's a great example for me of like a more synthetic or integrated practice. Um, and certainly it touches on the opening of the heart. Um, I also think it's very much an awareness practice, you know, uh, getting in touch with the simple feeling of being. And it's also a mindfulness practice because it involves a moment to moment noticing and noting of what's, of what's arising. And then finally, in my experience is also, it's an incredible concentration practice. Um, great for developing pleasant states of absorption um, and even jhana uh, meditative absorption because the emphasis in the practice is on um, two things. One, noting and noticing the essential nature of mind, which I'll, which I'll get into. And the second thing that the essence noting does is it, it supports and encourages the shameless cultivation of positive, pleasant, enjoyable states of mind. Um, and it does both of those things. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's an interesting practice. Originally, this was developed by my friend and teacher, Kenneth Folk, um, in the probably around 2010 or 11. And this was one of the social noting techniques as he was working on that whole approach and translating over some of the traditional noting practices to the out loud interpersonal form. Uh, this was one that he kind of made up himself. Like this was pretty well just constructed. And I, I still think it's one of the most beautiful techniques that he came up with as part of the suite of social noting practices. And originally it was called Mahamudra noting. Um, I, I and some others encouraged him, you know, to, to steer away from getting into any kind of uh, friction with the Tibetans. Uh, even though very much that is the spirit uh, of this practice, it's, that's the inspiration. Um, there's a particular quote. Um, I think of this as the kind of like, uh, like if you've if you've ever studied Zen koans or heard of Zen koans, often it starts with just a little line. And then there's like, you're working with that, with that sort of line, or you're working with the commentary on it. There's, there's a kind of core sort of poem or line that you're, you're kind of like unpacking in practice. And, and for me, the, the core, um, the core message of this practice is captured in the words of Rangjan Dorje, who was the third Karmapa, the third of a line of spiritual teachers in Tibet, um, who taught Mahamudra and, and which the Mahamudra tradition originated. And um, it goes like this, and it's a it's an aspirational prayer for Mahamudra. And he says, it doesn't exist. Even the victorious ones haven't seen it. It's not non-existent because it's the basis of all samsara and nirvana. This is not a contradiction because it's the unity of the middle way. He ends, may we realize the true nature of mind, which is beyond all limitations and extremes. So it ends with a nice little meta phrase there at the end. May we realize the true nature of mind beyond all limitations and extremes. So this for me, it's a beautiful pointer, like a pointing out toward what is the essential nature of mind. So in this practice, the first part of it is we're going to be trying to notice <laughs> the essential nature of mind. Now, Mahamudra also, if you translate it into English, one way you can translate it, Maha is often translated as great. And Mudra, as many of you probably know, if you've taken a yoga class or studied any Indian philosophy, Mudra is uh, often a type of gesture, hand gesture, body gesture. So we could say Mahamudra is the great gesture. Um, and what is the great gesture? Well, as Rangjan Dorje said, it doesn't exist. Even the victorious ones haven't seen it. So the essential nature of mind is not something that one can experience as a normal experience. It's not a state of consciousness or a physical sensation. It's if it were any of those things, then the essential nature of mind would be ephemeral and not, not very essential. <laughs> um, and so the great gesture 
in this practice is to turn toward that which you're not going to experience. So here, I can hear the sounds of the lawnmower driving by. And if I just listen to the sounds of the lawnmower, I hear them. That's not the essential nature of mind, the sounds of the lawnmower, exactly. That doesn't exclude the essential nature of mind either. But hear the great gestures to turn toward that which you're not going to be able to experience, or to taste, or to touch, or to smell, or to see, or to hear. And so one way you can turn toward the essential nature of mind is to make this great gesture, to, to turn toward it anyway, even though it's not going to be something that we experience. And one way that we could do this, and this is the way that Kenneth designed this practice, is that we can listen for a sound that you're not going to be able to hear. You can imagine it, of course, but not actually something that's going to be audible in your physical environment. So for many people, um, and this is the suggestion Kenneth gave originally, you can listen for the sound of the ships in the harbor. Or you can listen for the sound of the stars in the sky. Or for the sound of the worms in the earth, or the spiders in the desert. Whatever makes sense to you, just pick something that you can listen for, that you connect with as an imaginary object that you won't hear. And then just turn toward it, turning toward listening for the sound of the stars in the sky. And then you can note listening. Listening. Of course, we're not gonna hear them, but there's still a turning toward the great gesture, listening. And you can just notice what happens as you listen. So that's the first instruction, the first part of this practice. At any, po at any point in the practice, you could just note listening, listen for the sound of something you won't hear. Um, that's the essential nature of mind peace, okay? Because we know if we hear it or if we experience it or if we sense it, that's not it, but it's not non-existent because it's the basis of everything that's arising and passing and experience. The essential nature of mind permeates all experience equally. So turning toward the essential nature of mind is great. Um, and a lot of practices are designed just to do that, you know, to not fixate on any experience, to just rest in the open awareness that it's primordial. Um, that's great. But the other goal in Buddhist practice is not just to let go and be free. It's also to cultivate um, virtuous qualities of heart and mind, um, to develop oneself. And so in this practice, as we listen, and open, we might notice expansive states of mind, beautiful states of mind, blissful states of mind, like joy, bliss, peace, freedom. So in this practice, the second instruction is at any point, you're also welcome to note any positive or pleasant states of mind that arise. If it's arising and you notice it, feel free to note it, to give voice to it. And then of course, um, not only pleasant mind states will arise, uh, like not for long. So when an unpleasant mind state arises, when you're hanging out and blissing out, and then suddenly you feel like a contraction in your back or you feel this the creeping thought of doom you know like oh no i've got this thing later today i've got to deal with then instead of just trying to like avoid that or turn away or be like no no i've got to just experience bliss let me turn back toward the bliss um instead in this practice we can also work with anything that's unpleasant or difficult when it arises by using one of two notes this is a binary note releasing or allowing, releasing or allowing. And um, 
in this case, the spirit of releasing is kind of the spirit of letting go, of noticing and releasing, so just kind of letting go. And sometimes, you know, we're able to do that um, in our practice, we're able to let go. And sometimes the simplest thing is just like, oh, not right now. No, nope, let go. That simple. Um, at other times, it's not at all that simple, as you know. And as much as we want to release something, <laughs> it continues to take hold of us. So um, I would say here, it's also can be quite skillful to you know, allowing, just to allow the experience to be present, allow the contraction, the unpleasantness, the difficulty, the sphere, the anxiety, the sadness, the grief. Just allowing, allowing, making space, making room. Releasing or allowing when the unpleasant experiences arise. That's the third part of the instruction. So there's three choices. Whenever it's your turn or you feel moved, depending on how we're practicing, you can use any of these three. You can just note listening, listening, turning toward the essential nature of mind. You're not going to see it. it. doesn't exist. It's not non-existent because it arises as all experience. And we want to turn toward and nurture the positive to, to stoke the flames of joy. And so in this practice, we can also note any positive mind state that arises. By noting it, we, we, we encourage its growth. We bring attention to it. Um, and then the third part of the instruction is to release or allow any unpleasant states that arise. So we don't want to avoid them or ignore them. In fact, we want to turn right toward them and be with them, allow them to dissolve, allow them to be, allow them to grow, whatever they're going to do. And in the allowing, we are not completely embedded in those states. So there's some part of us that's allowing, and that's a pleasant mind state. So by allowing or releasing, we're cultivating the pleasant by turning toward the unpleasant. We're using contraction to springboard us into expansion, not by ignoring it and trying to contract around expansion, which doesn't work. So this is, a, I think it's a brilliantly designed practice to cultivate the positive. And at the same time, we know whatever state of mind is arising, even if it's extremely pleasant and expansive and joyful, that's not it. Listening. What is the essential nature of mind? 